My name is Adam Bergasser, and I'm an assistant professor of physics at UC San Diego. They're kind of a, a crossover between stars and planets. They're a very recently found population of very cool, dim things, and we're just learning a, a whole bunch about them just in the last couple years, really. So all stars have one thing in common, that they fuse hydrogen in their cores, and that's what provides their energy to radiate light out into the universe. These objects are too low mass, and so they never get hot enough in their cores, and so they don't fuse hydrogen. So at some level, they, they could have been stars, but for whatever reason, they don't have enough mass, and they kind of just pizzle out. And so uh, they don't have the energy source, and so they just get colder and radiate their energy away. For the brown dwarfs, we now know there are three distinct classes of these objects. They're called L dwarfs, T dwarfs, and Y dwarfs. Y dwarfs are new, they're just in the last year or so. And um, each of those have different chemicals in their atmosphere, and those chemicals, again, because uh, they have different temperatures, starting from the warm L dwarfs down to the coldest Y dwarfs. The relation of those spectral classes to evolution is that as an L dwarf cools over time, as it loses its heat energy, it actually changes from one spectral type to another. So it will start off actually as a very warm M dwarf. It will then cool to an L dwarf, then a T dwarf, and then a Y dwarf, and eventually it will cool to something that we haven't found yet. Um, that's different than stars, because when stars form, they stay at the same temperature. So whatever spectral type they are, they're that spectral type for most of its life. These things change spectral type with time. A brown dwarf might be an M dwarf for maybe 10 million years or 100 million years. It'll be an L dwarf for another billion years, and it'll be a T dwarf for 10 billion years, and it'll be a Y dwarf for longer than the age of the universe today. Well, I have a soft spot for T dwarfs because they were the objects I studied as a graduate student. Um, but they're interesting as brown dwarfs because their atmospheres are full of water, methane, ammonia, uh, and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide as well. So all these gases are the kind of gases that we see in planetary atmospheres. If you look at Jupiter, it has methane and ammonia, and deep down it has water in its atmosphere. So when we look at a T-dwarf, we're looking at a planetary-like atmosphere with the same gases as planet atmospheres do. So we identify different chemicals in their atmospheres based on the spectrum that they show, and we measure this with special instruments called spectrographs. And when you look at the spectrum of a source, you'll see uh, lines and bands, and those lines and bands happen at very specific wavelengths. And we know that different chemicals that we can measure here on Earth also absorb at those wavelengths. So by matching up our laboratory spectrum with the spectrum of a star, we can tell what's in the atmosphere. And the chemicals that we see in the atmospheres are, they're chemicals, so they are affected by chemistry. So when you change the temperature of the atmosphere, or when you change the pressure, uh, just like you have different chemistry in the atmospheres of planets, we also see different chemistry in the atmospheres of these very cool stars. So for the L dwarfs, for example, we see a lot of metal hydrides, iron hydride, calcium hydride, stuff like that. And those disappear when we go to the T dwarfs because they literally form rocks that rain out of the atmosphere. So the absorption features from those species disappear from the spectrum, and they're replaced by new absorption, species, uh, new absorption features from things like methane, ammonia, and stuff like that. And that's how we know that that's a T dwarf and what's in its atmosphere. So we can't see them in visible light, and so we have to move to the infrared, uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we use special instruments that have uh, infrared sensitive detectors, and there are cameras on telescopes that have been scanning the skies at these wavelengths. And so, and those, and these generate catalogs of infrared sources. And so as an astronomer trying to find them, I look through those catalogs, try to find sources that are bright in the infrared, but invisible at the optical wavelengths that we can see. And then uh, we go and follow them up and see if they have the spectral uh, shape that makes, matches an L dwarf, T dwarf, or a Y dwarf. Well, so we mostly see brown dwarfs very nearby only because they're so faint, that's as far as that we can detect them. Uh, they're so feeble uh, in their light that we only see the nearest ones. Uh, they're probably brown dwarfs out to the edge of the galaxy and beyond. In fact, we see brown dwarfs near us that have spent some part of their lives out in the distant galaxy. But because they are so faint, we just can't detect them. So there's a limit to how far we can see, but there's no limit to how far they actually are. 
Well, we're continually searching for new, very cold brown dwarfs, and it may be that in the next 10 years, we will find what are effectively the coldest brown dwarfs in the galaxy. And, and that will happen if it turns out brown dwarfs have a minimum mass. Right now, we don't know how low mass a brown dwarf can go. It might have the same mass as Jupiter, for example. But if it's not that low mass, we might find that we stop finding brown dwarfs below a certain temperature. And that will tell us that there's a fundamental limit to how small a star can be. So I think that's something we may learn in the next 10 years, which is very important for understanding star formation in general. Um, we're, one of the important measurements for brown dwarfs that we don't have right now are measurements of their radii. Uh, brown dwarfs are very small from a star perspective. They're about the size of Jupiter, so pretty big to us, but from a star that's very, very small. Uh, that's based on theories. But if we really want to understand, if we know the physics of that theory, if we know the physics of these objects correctly, we need to actually make the measurement of the size. And so that's something that I think, again, over the next 10 years, as we find examples of binaries that might be eclipsing and passing in front of each other, uh, or just systems where we can actually make a direct radius measurement, uh, we'll actually be able to answer the question of whether we know the physics of these objects directly. We're also now starting to find very young brown dwarfs that are just in the process of forming, uh, things that we call juvenile brown dwarfs, uh, maybe 10 or 100 million years old. Uh, and those are important because that's right about the epoch when planets start to form around normal stars. So if we start to find planets around these very young brown dwarfs, that will tell us, again, that maybe brown dwarfs form a lot more like stars than planets themselves.